Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Harvard Catholic Forum. I am Deacon Tim O'Donnell, director of the Forum, and I'm delighted to welcome you, both you who are with us in Memorial Church here in Harvard Yard, and those joining us on the live stream. I know all of us are honored and excited to be hosting Bishop Barron today. Let me begin with a brief word about the Harvard Catholic Forum. Our mission is to share the riches of Catholic thought and culture through lectures, non-credit courses, master classes, reading groups, and other programs. Today's lecture by Bishop Barron is one we present together with the Harvard Catholic Center with the amazing chaplaincy that serves the vibrant Catholic community here at, here at Harvard under Fathers Bill Kelly, George Saltzman, and Patrick Fiorillo. The Harvard Catholic Forum shares a common mission in the contemporary university with our fellow members in the Illumine network of university-facing centers of Catholic thought. They join us today as co-sponsors, bringing this event to other campuses by live stream, specifically the, Union, the Lumen Christi Institute at the University of Chicago, Collis Cornell, the Collegium Institute at Penn, the St. Anselm Institute at the University of Virginia, and the Nova Forum at USC. And finally, this event is made possible through the support of the John Templeton Foundation through the grant Illumine, promoting Catholic intellectual tradition at campuses nationwide. <clears throat> this afternoon's lecture and Q&A will be archived on the Harvard Catholic Forum YouTube channel. Please share that link with friends and colleagues who would be interested but may not be able to join us now. You can learn more about the Harvard Catholic Forum on the Forum's website at harvardcatholicforum.org, where you can register for future events, sign up for our emailings, watch archive programs, and support our important mission by making a financial contribution. All of our programs are free of charge, but they are not free to put on, so we are grateful for your help. So let me give you a roadmap of today's event. The lecture segment will last 35 minutes or so, and then we will have an opportunity for some Q&A. Those of you who are here in person should have received a note card and pencil when you came in. If you have a question, please write it on the card, and shortly after 4.30, you can raise the card up and some of our valued student fellows will come down the aisles and collect the cards and bring them to me. I will pass on as many of the questions as I can. Unfortunately, we are not able to take questions from the live stream audience today. And here's something important. Please, please help us to evaluate and improve our programs by filling out our two-minute survey after the program today. You who are here should have a paper survey you can complete with a pencil and drop in one of the baskets that our student fellows will hold out as you leave. Zoom participants will get an online version, which again only takes a couple of minutes to click through. Thank you for your help with this. Well, our speaker this afternoon truly needs no introduction, so I will be brief. Bishop Robert Barron, founder of the Word on Fire Catholic Ministries, <clears throat> is one of the, uh, the most followed speakers in contemporary media with over 131 million YouTube videos. He, uh, uh, views, excuse me. He is the author of numerous books. <laughs> He is the author of numerous books and articles for both academic and general audiences, and host of the groundbreaking film series, Catholicism, which aired on PBS, <clears throat> and more recently, Catholicism, The Pivotal Players, which won an Emmy Award and has been syndicated for national television. He currently serves as Bishop of Winona Rochester, Minnesota, and was formerly Professor of Theology and Rector President of Mundelein Seminary. His doctorate in sacred theology is from the University of Paris. Please join me in welcoming Bishop Barron. Thank you. 
Thanks, everybody. Well, thank you, Deacon Tim, for that. And thank you, everybody, for coming today. Listen, I, I'm delighted to be here. I had mass this morning at uh, St. Paul's, the beautiful church, and then to be in this historic place at this uh, greatest of American universities is really a, a thrill for me. So thank you, everybody, for having me. Uh, my topic, as you know, is the Catholic intellectual tradition. And I want to begin with a brief story. I'll go back about 20 years now when the new atheists were at the height of their influence. I was on a radio program based in Canada, and we were debating uh, Christopher Hitchens. And the host and I went back and forth, and he was taking Hitchens' view, and I was battling away. And after about 45 minutes, the show comes to an end, and the man said this to me, well, Father, would you at least admit that Hitchens got you Catholics thinking about these things for the first time? <laughs> well, I let my annoyance sink in. <laughs> And then I said, look, I'm the very inadequate representative of the oldest intellectual tradition in the West that includes Origen, Augustine, Chrysostom, uh, Ambrose, uh, uh, Anselm, Thomas Aquinas, John Henry Newman, G.K. Chesterton. I said, no, we didn't need Christopher Hitchens to get us thinking about this for the first time. So I want to say just a few simple things about, I know we could go on you know, for semesters about the Catholic intellectual tradition, but just a few basic uh, themes I want to explore with you this afternoon. Here's, I think, the most fundamental claim of the Catholic intellectual tradition. And I'd say this, that Jesus Christ is epistemically basic. Jesus Christ is epistemically basic. What that means is he is the privileged lens through which the whole of reality is read. Now, if you think that's an imperialistic claim, you're wrong because every intellectual system, I don't care what it is, takes something to be epistemically basic. I don't care if you're the most secularist philosopher, you're the most materialist scientist, you're taking some paradigm or norm as epistemically basic. The Catholic tradition takes Jesus Christ as epistemically basic. Now, it doesn't mean for a second that we don't listen to all sorts of other wisdom. No, that's part of the Catholic genius, is that from the beginning we've taken in ideas and concepts and systems of thought from all around. But Jesus remains epistemically basic. He is the privileged lens. Now, how come we say this? You say, well, isn't Jesus just one more you know, prophet among many? He's just a latter-day Jeremiah. And that's just the point. The New Testament makes such maximalist claims about Jesus that the epistemic implication is that he is the, the definitive lens. What I mean is he's not presented to us as simply one prophet among many, one religious spokesperson among many. Rather, we hear that he is the word. He is Logos, capital L. He is the divine pattern. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Therefore, all of the logoi of the world, of the various sciences and perspectives, have to be read from the standpoint of the Logos. That's the basic claim of the Catholic intellectual tradition. Now, as we look through the lens of Jesus, we're going to see certain things more clearly. First of all, something about God. I'll talk about that. Secondly, something about us, about human beings. Thirdly, something about creation. Now, if I get to my 35 minutes, they're off to bring it to a stop. I have one more thing I might say, but it depends on time. So as we look through the lens of Jesus, what do we know about God? The first thing we know is this. That God is not competitive with the world. Now, how do I know that? Because we say that in Jesus Christ, God becomes human. Mind you, not turning into a human being, stopping, ceasing to be God, not overwhelming the integrity of the human being he becomes, but rather in Jesus, the Council of Chalcedon teaches this, two natures, divine and human, come together without mixing, mingling, or confusion. That's a very interesting and peculiar claim, by the way. God and a creature come together in such a way that neither one is compromised. How is that possible? It's possible only if 
God is not a competitive being among many. How would this chapel become ashes? Oh, by being destroyed. How does the antelope become the lion? By being devoured. Worldly realities, worldly events, and so on are mutually exclusive. They can't take up the same place at the same time. So if the claim is being made that in Jesus, God and humanity come together non-competitively, God must not be a thing in the world. God must not be the biggest thing around, the biggest being of all. Now here can I suggest everybody, atheists both old and new, so go back to the, the Feuerbach and so on, come all the way up to Christopher Hitchens by way of Jean-Paul Sartre and Bertrand Russell, the mistake they all make is thinking that Catholic theology holds God to be a being. Does he exist or not? Let's find out. Some say there is such a being, others say there isn't. Let's now look in the world. Let's experiment and see if there's evidence one way or the other. That's precisely what God is not. Precisely the wrong way to look for God. Remember the story um, about the Russian cosmonauts back in the 50s that went up in the first you know, space flights? And they're up in space, and well, they looked around, we've seen no God. That's the same category mistake. Watch something now in our great theologians, how God is described. Thomas Aquinas does not use the term ens sumum to talk about God. Latin for highest being. So we're beings, this, this chapel's a being, uh, uh, the planet Saturn is a, is a being, and God must be the biggest being of them all. No, says Aquinas, God's not ens sumum. Rather, Aquinas says God is ipsum esse subsistens. God is the sheer act of to be itself. Not one being among many, he can't be, but the sheer act of to be itself, in and through which all finite things come to be. In Philosophy 101, we all I'll read the famous ontological argument of St. Anselm, right? God is that than which nothing greater can be thought. It's greater to exist both outside and inside the mind and simply inside the mind. Therefore, God exists, right? But stay with that opening description of God, which is extremely interesting. God is that than which nothing greater can be thought. That can't be the supreme being. Because the supreme being, there's all these different beings, and there's one at the tip top of the hierarchy of being, that being plus the rest of the world would be greater than that being alone. Therefore, that being cannot be that than which nothing greater can be thought. Anselm's giving us, typical of the Catholic intellectual tradition, a very strange characterization of God. Thomas Aquinas says, in God, Essence and existence coincide. Interesting description. So in all finite categorical things like this chapel, like me, like this podium, you have being, the act of existing, but it's poured, as it were, into a defining receptacle. He calls essence or whatness, quiditas. So I say, well, this is a podium. It's a type of being. I'm a human being. I'm a type of thing. This chapel is an architectural object, etc. Then there's God. What's God? Who is God? Now go back to the third chapter of the book of Exodus. Moses asks God that question, doesn't he? What's your name? And God says essentially, stop asking stupid questions, right? <laughs> because God's famous answer, I am who I am is driving in this direction. It's the source of the tradition that I'm talking about. Moses is asking a very commonsensical question. What kind of being are you? What category do you fit into? How do I compare you to other beings? And God's answer is meant to, to break all those categories. I am who I am. David Burrell, the Catholic philosopher, says, to be God is to be to be, 
To be me is to be human. To be this is to be a podium. To be Saturn is to be a planet. To be God is to be to be. Now, you say, how is this anything but just very, very high abstractions that matter not at all? Well, now I come to my second point. See, this, I would claim, everybody, is the hinge. When you get this one wrong, it's like a golf swing. If your takeaway is bad, you're not going to recover, right? The takeaway's got to be good. If you get your theology of God wrong, then the whole thing is going to fall apart. What follows from this claim, and now we come to what I'm calling the radical humanism of the Catholic intellectual tradition. What follows from this claim is that God is not competitive to us. Just the contrary. The closer God gets to us, the more alive we are the more ourselves we are. Stay with the Exodus chapter 3. How does Moses see God? But in this great image of the burning bush, which is on fire, but not consumed. The closer God gets to creation, the more luminous and beautiful it becomes without being consumed. Mind you, look at the old Greek and Roman myths. When the gods or goddesses appear, when they come bursting into the world, what happens? People are incinerated. <laughs> Things have to give way. There's a kind of bullying quality, and that's because the gods and goddesses are competitive beings. They're high beings, en sumum, if you want, the highest beings. Therefore, when they come into the world, they, they, come, they come into it competitively, aggressively. Then there's the true God, who sets the world on fire, and makes it beautiful, luminous, and does not consume it. Can I go back now to the, um, the early councils of the church when they were trying to hammer out the understanding of who Jesus Christ is? There were various options on the table in the ancient world. One is, Jesus is divine and not really human. That's the monophysite approach. On the other extreme, the Nestorian approach would say Jesus is a human being who has a profound relationship to God. He's like a high saint. And then in the middle, there was a mediating position staked out as such called Arianism. That was a bit like the ancient mythological views. Jesus is a kind of hybrid of divinity and humanity like Achilles or Hercules. What does the church say? It's very interesting to me. What the church say is it looked at these various options. It said no, no, and no. Rather, at the Council of Chalcedon, as I said, Jesus is simultaneously fully divine, fully human. His humanity not compromised by the proximity of his divinity, his divinity not compromised by the proximity of his humanity, but rather the two existing in mutual perfection side by side. What follows from this, everybody, is, I'm going to make a bold claim. There is no humanism anywhere east or west, anywhere across the ages, no humanism greater than Christian theology. I say that without fear of contradiction. How come? Because the goal of Christianity is not simply the liberation and the political or economic liberation of human beings, not just the psychological you know, amelioration of our, our condition. The ordinary goal of the Christian life is to become divinized. There's a great statement you find in almost all the church fathers. Deus fit homo, ut homo fieret Deus. That means God became human, that we humans might become God. <laughs> it's, a, it's a staggering claim. I'll say it again. We, God became one of us, that we lowly humans might become divinized. 
How is that possible? Because God's not competitive with us. How is it possible? Because he's not a supreme being who, who exists in this sort of antagonistic relationship. In Jesus, divinity and humanity come together without mixing, mingling, confusion in mutual harmony. That's the ground of Christian humanism. And I would argue there's, there's none that could be greater than that. There's no aspiration of a human being higher than divinization. Can I look at this now just in terms of one issue? We could develop a, a, a Catholic humanism in a hundred different ways, but let me look at just one issue. And that's the issue of freedom. I'm standing in this place, you know, in Harvard University in Boston and, and how, how central freedom was to our founders, how central freedom is to our whole political imagination. There was a controversy back in the eighth century called the Monothelite Controversy. The claim is being made that in Jesus there's only one will, divine. He's got one divine will. The human will has been, been eliminated. The church fought about this, but the resolution of the Orthodox Church was no, not just one will. There are two wills in Jesus, a divine will and a human will. Now see, it's in line with that Chalcedonian logic I just laid out, that the natures come together without mixing, mingling, or confusion. If that's true, well then, there must be two wills, two freedoms. Now see what that means, though, everybody. It means that the divine freedom can come intimately close to human freedom and not compromise it, not crush it. Move from the 8th century to the 20th century. Jean-Paul Sartre, right, the founder of existentialism, had a wonderful little syllogism. It's logically correct, even though it's, it's, uh, it's a wrong conclusion. Here's the syllogism. If God exists, I cannot be free. But I am free. Therefore, God does not exist. That's his basic argument against God. But you see, what's it predicated upon? It's predicated upon the exact opposite of everything I've been arguing today. If God exists, I can't be free. Sartre's assuming that God is a competitive supreme being who be oppressive to my freedom. The more God comes in the picture, the less I'm in the picture. And so Sartre, asserting his human freedom, says there can be no God. The Monothelite controversy and its orthodox resolution is the effective anticipated refutation of Jean-Paul Sartre. In Jesus, two wills, divine and human, come together without mixing, mingling, or confusion. In fact, the divine freedom is enhanced by the proximity of the divine freedom. How's that work? How's that work? The modern sense of freedom would say something like this. Freedom is fundamentally indifference in the face of, of the yes and the no. I hover above the yes and no, and I can say on the basis of my pure will, yes or no. But the classical world, the biblical world, didn't see freedom that way at all. For them, freedom is more like this. Freedom is the disciplining of desire so as to make the achievement of the good first possible and then effortless. Anyone that's ever learned a musical instrument or how to swing a golf club or, or to play a sport knows what I'm talking or speak a language knows what I'm talking about. As I, over the years, struggled to learn different languages, what I felt in that process was unfree. Right? I'm, I'm trying to speak French, I'm trying to say what I want to say, but I can't. And now I'm working more with Spanish. I'm trying to express myself in Spanish, and I, I don't feel free to do it. But I do feel free to speak English. Is that because I decided early on to speak any old way I wanted to? Well, no, of course not. It's because I internalized the laws of the English language, its syntax, its grammar, its vocabulary, so thoroughly it became second nature to me. 
I discipline my desire to speak in such a way that I can now speak English effortlessly. Same with a golf swing, same with you know, a musical instrument. Now think about this. The non-competitive God, not a supreme being, not, not bumping up against our autonomy, but the God who lets us be, the more that God is internalized, the more, I'll use biblical language here, that God's law is written in my heart, the freer I become, the freer I become, my desire disciplined in such a way that I can achieve the good I want. Can I suggest to everybody, so much of modern philosophy is predicated upon that sort of Sartrean view of a competitive, overbearing God who's a threat to human freedom and human flourishing. And I say a plague on that God. That's an idol. That's a false God. The proper understanding of God gives rise to the sweetest sort of humanism. My hero here is um, Saint Irenaeus of Lyon, the great second century, early, early figure. He said, Gloria Dei homo vivens. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. Can I suggest that sums up everything I've been saying so far this afternoon. Gloria Dei homo vivens. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. That's not a competitive God speaking. That's the God who glories in our being fully human. Third point, I'll stop with this one. Looking at reality through the lens of Jesus Christ has told us something important about God, something very important about our own humanity. And finally, it tells us something very important about the whole of creation, the whole of creation. See, if God is not an ens sumum, but esse ipsum subsistence, God is the sheer act of to be itself, that means that anything that exists apart from God has come fully and utterly from God. Here theologians talk about creatio ex nihilo, creation from nothing. That means there's literally nothing that stands between God and the world. Everything that exists outside of God comes from God. Now, several things follow from this insight. Here's the first one. That all of finite reality is marked radically by intelligibility. The medieval said this a long time ago, only ends as shibboleth. All being is knowable. If everything's come from God, it must be marked by something like intelligible form. Now, might I join many others here in arguing, this is precisely why the modern physical sciences emerged out of a Christian university matrix. It's the theological doctrine of creation which teaches this truth, that we should expect finite reality in every detail to be marked by intelligibility that made the sciences possible. I'm always intrigued by, um, uh, it's Einstein himself said this, that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. And it's true, and it? it's strange. We take it so for granted, but it's a strange truth that in every nook and cranny, we need intelligibility. Why should that be the case? Well, we would know by looking at reality through the lens of Jesus Christ, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and through that Word, all things came to be. In other words, creation is not dumbly there, it's intelligibly there. Uh, there's a wonderful literature that has grown up around an article written by Eugene Wigner in 1960. Maybe you know about this, the science people. Uh, Wigner was in that generation of physicists, Niels Bohr and company. Um, and he was not a religious man, he was a secular Jew. But he wrote this article, and it has this marvelous title of the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the physical sciences. 
the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the physical sciences. What was he noticing? Well, what any physicist in the 20th century, now 21st century, would acknowledge that you can't do science at the highest level without extremely complex mathematics. Why should extremely complex mathematics correspond to the way things are? Why should this sort of high, high level mathematical speculation be effective, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the physical sciences? Unless someone like a mathematician is behind it. So fundamental intelligibility follows from this doctrine of creation. That's why, I mean, by the way, everybody, and we could do a whole lecture series on this, but why I've always found so frustratingly stupid the battles between you know, religion and science, whatever you mean by those two terms. Authentic religion and authentic science are not in an antagonistic relationship with one. They oughtn't to be, anyway. Here's a second conclusion that we get from looking at reality through the lens of Christ. Nonviolence is the most basic metaphysical reality. Let me say it again. Nonviolence is the most basic metaphysical reality. Why would I say this? Look in almost all the, the myths of the ancient world, the myths of creation. The claim is made that order comes through some great act of violence. One god defeating another, one set of gods defeating another set of gods. Often the, the body parts of the defeated gods making up the physical world. Something like antagonism stands at the source of order. That's the point. Then there's the biblical account. See, in the biblical account, God has no rival. God's not battling any rival power. How could ipsum esse subsistence have a rival power? He can't. Rather, God makes the whole universe through a nonviolent and intelligent act of speech. Can you see now, everybody, when you visit the um, Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' great teaching about enemy love, about turning the other cheek, about nonviolence. And, and when you look at the cross of Christ, and what do you see but the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount exemplified? Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Jesus taking on all of the negativity of, of sin and responding to it in nonviolent forgiveness. What are you seeing there? Not just a fine ethical teaching, but the revelation of a metaphysical truth it's a going with the deepest grain of the universe that order comes not through antagonism and violence, but through nonviolence. That's the wonderful tradition stretching right up from Jesus through so many of the church fathers into great prophetic voices today, the nonviolence of Christian metaphysics. Here's a, here's a related implication. This is a line again from Thomas Aquinas. Thomas said that the creature is, and I'll put it first in his Latin, he said, quedam relatio ad creatorum. The creature is a kind of relationship to the creator. Now see what's interesting about that. It's not as though you have God, and then there's this creature over there, and then they have a relationship. That can't be true if God is ipsum esse, God is the sheer act of to be itself. Every creature, him or herself or itself, is always already a relationship to God. The, the, the illusion of sin, in a way, is that I've fallen out of this, that I've, I've had a rupture in my relationship. In the most fundamental metaphysical sense, I can't. To, to be a creature is, is always already to be a relationship to God. Thomas Merton, the Trappist author from the last century, used to say, prayer is finding that place in me where I am here and now being created by God. That's splendid, splendid characterization of prayer. Not trying to, to restore some lost, severed relationship, but finding right now where I am being created by God. 
Herbert McCabe, the Dominican theologian, said that God sustains the universe the way a singer sustains a song. So every moment we're being sung, as it were, into being. That's, again, the nonviolence and relationality that's metaphysically fundamental. A further implication also related. We are willy-nilly, right, whether we want to be or not, we are connected to everybody else and everything else in the cosmos. Go back to Merton. If prayer is finding the place in me where I am here and now being created by God, when I find that place, I found the same place in you and the same place in you and the same place that this chapel has been created. That's why St. Francis can speak of brother sun and sister moon. He's not just engaging in fine poetry. That's exact metaphysics. That everything in the cosmos is related to everything else precisely through God. Again, look now at the teaching of Jesus, the ethical teaching under that rubric. That enemy love is not just a, a fine ethical sentiment. It's recovering this basic metaphysical truth. You know those um, rose windows in the Gothic churches that I, I came to love so much when I was a student over in Paris? Um, great wheels of light and color. The center is always a depiction of Christ. And then wheeling around that center in ordered harmonies are all the other elements of the window. And then they're all connected by some kind of system of spokes to the center. The first time I went to Paris as a student, I was jet lagged and, and out of it and barely knew who or where I was. And I went down to Notre Dame and I stood in front of that North Rose for a half hour, just mesmerized by it. And you say, well, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty picture. Well, no, see, so much more than a pretty picture. It's the image in a way of everything I've been talking about. God in the center. Through God, all things holding together. This musical harmony that obtains because God is singing the universe into being. God delighting in this order, intelligibility, and harmony of his creation. The last part of my talk, which I'm going to skip because I'm out of time, is about how this thing falls apart through sin and then how it's repaired. See, because to carry the whole Christian story forward, in the beginning was the word, yes indeed, through whom all things come to be. But then that same word became flesh. And discovered what? Opposition from the world. See, how do we read the cross of Jesus? But a sign, judgment upon the world if you want, it's a sign of the sin and dysfunction that stands athwart the purpose of God. The fact that the Son of God, the author of life, came and we killed him is an extraordinary moment of judgment and revelation. Do you see what I mean? Just when I, I'm tempted to say, I'm okay and you're okay, forget it. The cross of Christ pulls back the veneer on that. It pulls back the veil to reveal the truth of our opposition to what I've been describing here. But the good news, everybody, is that the same Jesus who unveils this truth on the cross, on that same cross, reveals the ever greater mercy of God that can repair and overcome the resistance to what God wants. That's why St. Paul, who saw the risen Jesus, can say, I'm certain that neither death nor life, neither angels nor principalities, neither height nor depth, or any other creature could ever separate me from the love of Christ. Paul knows that because we killed God, and God returned in forgiving love, repairing, <laughs> renewing the creation the way he wanted it. Seems to me, everybody, the Catholic intellectual tradition stubbornly looks at God, the world, ourselves, the way we organize our societies through the lens of Jesus Christ. And it sees them according to a divine light. 
God bless you all. Thanks for listening today. Thank you so much, Bishop Barron. And we have many, many questions. We won't be able to get um, to a, a very large number of them. But let me start with this sure. one. Um, where does the Catholic intellectual tradition stand today in the face of liberal political philosophy, plural, pluralism, um, the democracy that is part of that, and so on? Yeah, it's a, it's a complex question. Um, it says yes to it in very significant ways. I think the Catholic tradition would say yes to modern liberalism and democracy in many ways. And in fact, we would argue uh, the prologue to the Declaration of Independence is unthinkable apart from at least the remains of a very integrated Christian vision of things. I would argue you can't really defend equality apart from God. You can't really defend human rights apart from the fact they're endowed by their creator, that we're endowed by our creator. So there, I think the church will smile very much on uh, modern liberalism and democracy. Um, go back to the 19th century and you'll see very smart Catholic thinkers who were also raising concerns and questions about the various experiments in liberal democracy. One issue being an excessive individualism. So Catholic social thought is marked not so much by individualism. It takes the family and it takes, um, uh, social connection as um, as basic. So there it would raise questions about uh, excessive individualism. Also, the relegating of the issue of virtue and goodness simply to the individual choice. So Jefferson's pursuit of happiness, when the classical tradition was exceptionally interested in what happiness really is, objectively, and didn't want to leave it simply to each individual to pursue. So, I mean, those are, are ways that we would uh, quarrel with or raise a question anyway about uh, modern liberalism. So it's a, it's a kind of um, yes and no, I would say. If God, if God is being, um, how is it that all of being itself is not also God? Because that's pantheism. So that would simply be a collapse of the created order into the uncreated order. To say God is ipsum esse is to say that in his very nature, his very nature is to be. The world, so everything in the world is not like that. So the world's made up of, of finite contingent things in whom essence and existence do not coincide. So you could say there's a radical difference between God and the world. So I look around this room and say, well, now, where's God in this room? And the right answer is, well, nowhere. God's not, God's not anything in this room. Where's God in this room? Correct answer, everywhere, right? Because nothing in this room would exist were it not sustained by God. So you're on a kind of uh, razor's edge with this question. Um, someone once said that Thomas Aquinas comes as close to pantheism as you can without being a pantheist. But, but see, I, I put it this way, if God is ipsum esse, he's simultaneously, and this is Augustine, superior sumo meo et intimior intimo meo. He's higher than anything I can imagine, and he's closer to me than I am to myself. But, but that's, that's the case if God is ipsum esse. So you have to avoid a pantheism that simply collapses them, but also avoid a deism that turns God into a supreme being. The Catholic view is, is neither nor, right? Um, let's see. Um, how does one respond to the deep inner sadness that results from and is intensified by maintaining an eschatological vision when living with secular people who are at least for now, anti-God. 
I'd have to probably unpack that question a little bit to understand what it means. But you know, I, you know the question of secularism and, and the opposition to God, um, if you take one idea from my talk, it would be much of the, of the secularist antipathy toward God is predicated upon a false understanding of God. It's, it's predicated upon a competitive view where, where God's opposed to my flourishing, God's opposed to my freedom. And the great message of the Bible and the, and the Catholic Christian tradition is au contraire, that, that the glory of God is, is our being alive. Um, are there good reasons why this thing got misconstrued? Yes, and that's because of very bad theology, very bad preaching, and very bad witness. I'll grant you all that. But at its best, the, the tradition would hold against that. Secularism is a reaction against a threatening God, it seems to me. That, that God's posing a threat to our flourishing, so we have to get God off the, the stage. But that's to misconstrue God. And, and the world is most itself when it has found a relationship to the supreme good, which is God. May I suggest too, I think what you're seeing today in a lot of younger people is the reassertion of the hunger for God. Um, you know, the, the, the new atheists and company from 20 years ago uh, you know, convinced so many people that, well, there's no God, uh, that's all media, that's all the Bronze Age mythology and superstitious nonsense and all that. Um, well, there's no God. That means we come from nothing. We go back to nothing. There's no objective ground for value. Um, that leaves you with a pretty bleak vision of life. And the whole thing started with a very incorrect understanding of God. So I, I'd want to go back and correct that problem. Well, let's jump into the problem of evil. Um, how does enemy love... Uh, nonviolence and the idea that everything comes from God reconcile with the existence of real evil that will destroy innocent people um, if we do not fight back. Yeah, and and you know the church would hold to a just war tradition and the right of self defense and all that. So that that should be said. Um, however, I'd, I'd want to re-emphasize this great tradition of nonviolence, which is not just in in Martin Luther King and and, and people in the 20th century, but goes all the way back to the very beginning of the church. Look at origin of Alexandria. Look at the very first uh, Christians. I think as a, um, as a last resort, indeed, as our teaching says, uh, just war and so on. But the first attempt, seems to me, should always be this, um, not passivity, but this engagement of evil through nonviolence. How does it work? It's, it's always a sort of holding a mirror up to evil so as to show the wicked person what he or she is doing, and thereby trying to draw that person into conversion. Nonviolence is like Aikido, you know, in, um, in martial arts, when you, you use the aggression of your opponent against him. So the, the, the point is not to destroy your opponent, it's to use the aggression against him in such a way that he's thrown to the ground. And there was a student of mine who was an Aikido um, aficionado, and he said the, the point of Aikido is to leave your opponent laughing on the floor because he just realizes I can't beat this guy. He's using my own aggression against me. Can you see the cross of Jesus as a kind of great act of cosmic Aikido? Is we say that he takes upon himself the sins of the world. So he reckons with the sins of the world, takes them upon himself, cruelty and violence and injustice and hatred and all the negativity of the world, but then outmaneuvers it through the ever greater divine love. Um, this becomes the model for a Christian engagement with evil. Granting that, yes, in our finite fallen world, sometimes as a last resort, one must uh, <clears throat> use violent means. But I think to recover that tradition of, um, of active nonviolence is, uh, is a good thing. Uh, <clears throat> the Catholic intellectual tradition has incorporated significant elements from Western civilization, say Greek philosophy or Roman law. Mm -hmm. Is it possible or necessary to incorporate more insights from Asian, African, um, or other traditions? Um, what is necessary for the Catholic intellectual tradition to continue developing in the 21st century. 
Yeah, and I, my short answer is is yes. I think mean, the church has always had a kind of openness at its best, you know, to the environing culture. John Henry Newman talks about the the power of assimilation. So as the church moves into whatever culture it finds itself in, it resists what it has to. So some things are antipathetic toward its nature. Uh, think of any animal moving through its environment. It has to resist certain things, but then it has to assimilate other things from the environment. It, if it does only one or the other, it'll die, right? So I, I have zero quarrel with that. I think as we move forward and to take in insights and uh, conceptual systems from other cultures, sure, absolutely. That's that's the generosity, I think, at the heart of it, at its at its best. Not that we've always exemplified that. You know, but I think at its best, um, sure. And then furthermore, sure that the church progresses, doctrine develops, again, to, re to refer to John Henry Newman, it unfolds and continues to show different dimensions. So yeah, nothing wrong with that. Um, the process of the human becoming God, of divinization, uh, seems to be deeply rooted in a contemplative tradition. Mm -hmm. Um, can you unpack a little bit um, how the active person in the world is divinized? Yeah, uh, through love. And, and love means to will the good of the other. And that's Thomas Aquinas. And, and that to me has always been enormously clarifying and helpful. To love is not a feeling, because feelings come and go. We can't really control them. Nothing wrong with feelings. And if, if the feelings come, Terrific, but love is an act of the will. It means I'm willing what's good for you, not my good through you. That's that's the trick of all of us sinners in this room, right? Is we, oh, I'll be very kind to you that you might be good to me. I'll be just to you that you might be just to me in return. But that isn't love. See, that's, that's just indirect egotism. To love is to break out of the black hole of my own self-regard. You think of the black hole that draws everything into itself, right? Well, that's the way we sinners operate. We move through the world like a black hole, and we're trying to draw everything into our ambit. To love is to break free of that gravitational pull and to say, I want what's good for you. So there's someone in the world in any capacity. And that's why I, I go back to the little flower and to Mother Teresa, you know, don't worry about doing great things. Do little things with great love. See, but everyone's capable of that. I can do the smallest thing. I can smile at someone who's annoying me. That's the little flower, you know, and so when there's a nun in the convent just annoyed the heck out of her. But she would smile at her. And, and not to be cloying or not to be, you know, sarcastic. She did it as an act of love. So it was a very small thing, a smile by a little unknown nun in, in Normandy in the late 19th century. No historian would ever dream of recording it, but it's the little thing done with great love. That's divinization. That's Christ living in me, right? Paul says, it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. When you can love in that simplest way, you're, you're on the path to divinization. This is a question about um, communication. Um, this vision, uh, from the Catholic intellectual tradition is so much at odds with so much in the culture today. Do you have a few pointers about good ways of communicating it? Well, I, I always think it's by the, the luminosity of your own life that people see in those who believe in God that their humanity is not compromised, they're not cramped, they're not crabby, they're not uh, less than alive. When they see that, no, you're, you're fully alive and, and your freedom and, and your talents and your humanity are all enhanced by your friendship with God. That preaches, right? That preaches. But also, and may I say, uh, I've been on this, this uh, thing for a long time, the, the Catholic Church dumbed down our own tradition. My generation was the first one to get it. Now it's a couple after mine where we've dumbed down the faith, we haven't communicated very well our own rich intellectual tradition. And that's been a tragedy. That's why when the new atheists came and we were terrible at fighting them, they, they were rehearsing the dumbest arguments from Feuerbach and company uh, with a nasty spirit, it seems to me. That's all that was new about it. 
But yet the, the Christian world was pretty pathetic. William Lane Craig being an exception maybe, but was pretty pathetic at fighting them. Well, partly it's because we threw all of our weapons away. You know, we, we dumbed down our, our tradition. And so people weren't able to say, no, 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 that's not what we hold. Or, no, that's not a correct view of God. So I thought two things. Let the luminosity of your own life shine forth and, um, and fight dumbed down Catholicism. This one really picks up on that. Um, you have spoken, not today, but um, very much about the way of beauty. Mm -hmm. um, which aligns with this non-competitive description of God, understanding of God. Um, so how do we invite uh, people to see God in this way through beauty, which is different from the way um, most people see God, even perhaps most Catholics? Yeah, it, it, it is essential to the Catholic tradition. So I, I talked about the intellectual tradition, but I could have talked about the aesthetic tradition. Um, if you have the three, the three transcendentals, right? The good, the true, and the beautiful. If, if God is to be itself, well, then God must be those three elements in the, in the supreme way. So he's supremely true and he appeals to our minds, supremely good, he appeals to our wills, and he's supremely beautiful, which appeals to, what do you wanna call it, our, our sensitivities. Um, which is why that's reflected in the Catholic tradition, just over at St. Paul's this morning, you know, that you walk in that church and it's a gorgeous place. And it's the very beauty of it that speaks to the soul of God. And um, we should never jettison that. I mean, that's, I, I've been in a lot of dialogues with my Protestant friends, and I'll, I'll say that I think that was a mistake of the Reformation, was jettisoning much of the, the beauty of the Catholic tradition. Um, and I understand they were responding to, you know, uh, distortions, et cetera. But I, I thought that was a baby with the bathwater solution. Um, uh, the, the beautiful is often the first way in. Read uh, Brideshead Revisited to see that, I think. You know, that's a great story of conversion. And it begins with the beauty of this manor house, Brideshead, that's symbolic of the church. It begins with the beauty of it. That's what draws the man in. And eventually he comes to the good and the true. But the beautiful comes first. Because I think the splendid often is what gets our attention. We open our eyes, ah, look at that. And then that draws us deeper and deeper in. So um, lead with the beautiful, I've been saying for a long time. Um, let me ask this question as the last one. Um, the room today is full of people who practice uh, professional academic um, disciplines, artistic disciplines at very high levels. Um, could you take a, any one of these disciplines and talk about how um, the Catholic intellectual tradition informs very essentially the way that it's practiced? Yeah, um, I, I was hinting at that with the math science thing, and I'll, I'll stay with that because so often that's seen as antipathetic to religion. If you talk to young people who have disaffiliated, almost every survey, number one reason, uh, science disproves religion. It's because I can't be scientific and religious. And t I just tear my hair out at that, you know, because not only does it represent our own abandonment of the faith, reason, and tradition, but as I was trying to argue there, the, the, greatest, uh, uh, the greatest access to what I call the invisible today would be through math and science. If, if you go back to Plato's uh, Republic and the parable of the cave, how come the first step out of the cave for Plato is math? Well, because when you understand a number, qua number, when you grasp an equation, qua equation, you have in a very real sense stepped out of this empirical world. You've stepped out of the world of, of evanescent changing things. You've come to grasp a truth that's true in itself, it's true in any possible world, it's true in an unchanging way. And that's why mathematics is the first step out of the cave, which symbolizes an obsession with the evanescent world. And that's why this is an ancient idea that math is the uh, threshold to religion. Well, what informs the sciences? And that's my Eugene Wigner um, reference. What informs the sciences today, but the highest kind of math? 
So see, I, I would argue science isn't, isn't opposed to religion. In fact, it's the threshold that leads you into religion. It, it's, and that's why the science has emerged up out of these Christian um, uh, universities. So th there I'd say every time you deal with an abstract mathematical truth, you are at least in the threshold of a religious consciousness. Wonderful. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Bishop Barron, and uh, thank all who contributed questions. I'm sorry we couldn't um, get to very many of them. Um, I'd like to ask again that everyone help us by filling out the quick survey and dropping it off as you leave, or for those on the live stream, uh, fill out the online version. Um, and check out future programs by visiting the Harvard Catholic Forum uh, website or pick up a brochure on the way out. And finally, Bishop Barron, would you kindly stand up and allow us to express our appreciation once again.